pregnancy may be tough in any era, but giving birth in ancient Egypt was certainly no picnic on the Nile. With infant mortality rates of up to 50% and little protection for mothers from labor complications, the ancient Egyptians enlisted a combination of practical tools and cultural mysticism throughout pregnancy and childbirth. Today on Nutty History, we're looking at what pregnancy was like in ancient Egypt. Before we can bring you the fruits of our labor, be sure to subscribe to our channel and let us know in the comments what nutty history you'd like to hear about next. Ancient Egyptians had a pretty advanced sex ed curriculum for their time. They utilized a variety of contraception methods over the years. Some of these methods, such as inserting a blockade of crocodile dung and sour milk into the vagina, might be best left behind in history. But others were surprisingly tech-savvy for the time. Ancient Egyptians created the first condoms from linen as a means of preventing the spread of disease. Women would also use various components from the acacia tree for birth control. Acacia gum has been found to have spermicidal properties, so this method was actually accurate. Croc manure, no longer necessary, ladies. Studies have also shown that certain times of the year were more popular for conception. July and August were the most popular months for baby making, coinciding with Roman Egyptian fertility festivals. December and January saw the least amount of conceptions, which could be related to early Christian sexual prohibitions during the Advent and Lenten seasons. Ancient Egyptians understood that it takes two to tango and knew that men provided an important ingredient to the reproductive process. Still, when it came to fertility problems, it was generally assumed that the woman required treatment. One suggested remedy was for a woman to squat over a hot stew of frankincense, oil, dates and beer to allow the vaporous mixture to enter her womb. Talk about a steamy scene. In addition to birth control, ancient Egyptians had an array of pregnancy tests, both practical and peculiar. Much like the pregnancy tests of today, one of the most accurate methods involved peeing on things and waiting. The test taker would urinate on bags of emma and barley seed. If neither grew, the woman was not pregnant. If the emma grew, it was thought that the woman was expecting a girl, and if the barley grew, a boy. Modern studies of this technique show that a non-pregnant person's urine does in fact prevent growth of the seeds. And as a pregnancy test alone, the method is about 70% accurate. However, the part about determining the sex of the baby was, in scientific terms, hogwash. So we don't recommend the bag peeing method for your gender reveal party. Other pregnancy tests with less proven results included covering a woman's breasts with oil and examining the color of the veins and more weird milk mixtures. A woman who had previously born a son would mix her milk with melon puree and the woman taking the test would drink it. If she became sick, she was thought to be pregnant. Hey, it's cheaper than the tests at CVS. While ancient Egypt is known for its cutting-edge medical advancements and technologies, childbirth did not appear to be a healthcare focus. There isn't much evidence that the Egyptians had a gynaecological unit or any physician-assisted births at all. It's thought that other women acted as midwives during labor. While nobility would be more likely to have maid servants or nurses to attend to them, for lower-class women, friends, family members or neighbors might act as midwives. Sisters were doing it for themselves. Records of childbirth practices are sparse, but some, such as the Cahun and Ebers papyri, detail medical knowledge and notes on the subject. However, as most of the expectant mothers of the time were illiterate, it's unlikely they could read up on the subject. It's more probable that many birthing practices were passed on through generations of women and midwives in a game of telephone WebMD. Giving birth was not a hospital-bound affair. Women would deliver their babies on the cool roof of a house or in a birthing arbor, which was essentially a room annexed to the home made of papyrus stalks and vine covering. Women gave birth standing, kneeling or squatting, and often used birthing bricks or chairs to maintain a position, with the midwife catching the baby upon delivery. Wow, what was on that? Butter. Newborns are slippery. Midwives might place a dish of hot water beneath a birthing chair to produce steam and ease delivery. There is not a lot of evidence of medical tools for labor, 
but it's thought that certain items may have been utilised, including a scissor-like instrument and a special knife for cutting the umbilical cord. That might sound painful, but the umbilical cord actually has no nerves. We're not so sure about those scissor jaws of life, though. Beyond the physical, Egyptians understood the importance of emotional well-being of expectant mothers. Birthing arbours and bricks were painted with scenes of childbirth and womanhood, which might have helped create a positive environment for those experiencing a painful and dangerous process. While pregnant women of ancient Egypt faced a long and life-threatening journey, motherhood meant respect and an increased status in society. Religion played an important role in ancient Egyptian childbirth. Mortality rates were high for both infants and mothers, which led the Egyptians to seek the help of gods and goddesses for a safe delivery. The god Bess was associated with pregnancy and delivery, and was also enlisted to ward off evil spirits and demons. Tawaret, a goddess with the head of a hippo, was also commonly invoked to help with pregnancy and children. These and others, such as Isis and Hathor, were often depicted in the birthing environment, in amulets and ivory-carved birthing wands that would be placed on the pregnant woman's abdomen. Prayers, spells and chants were also common during labour to assist in a speedy and pain-free delivery. After an incantation, the pregnant woman might go a step further and take on the persona of one of these goddesses and claim that she herself is Hathor in order to fend off evil or harm. Going through labour while also reincarnating into a goddess sounds like a lot of work. But whatever gets the job done. If all else failed, another spell threatened the gods with disaster if anything went wrong during the delivery. Don't mess with a woman in labour. The unusual testing methods didn't stop after the baby was born. A sick baby's chances of survival were assessed through the particular sounds of its cries and facial expression. If the infant made a sound like creaking pine trees or turned its face downward, it was expected to die. That's oddly specific, but okay. Parents immediately named their children. Babies might be named after a deity to ensure their protection. Others based the names off of physical traits or occupations. For instance, Pakamen, which means the blind one, or Pakapu, meaning bird catcher. That's a lot of career pressure to put on a newborn. For postnatal care, mothers were advised to eat a mouse, as this was thought to cure a number of ailments and pass along benefits through the breast milk. Probably not the first thing most new mothers are craving. Menstrual blood was also believed to possess powerful properties and was rubbed on newborns to ward off demons. We're guessing demons aren't the only ones who'd steer clear of these blood-covered babies. But let us know in the comments about your own weird pregnancy woes for the next Nutty History.